This clip deals with the history of the design and the construction of the 22 horsepower Australian modified VJ24W Sunfun. Probably the ultimate development of what's arguably the world's first ultralight motor glider. Photographed here at Glenlee Ag Strip near Glen Innes in northern New South Wales. in February 1992 clearly showing the aerodynamic benefits of the Australian modification to the fuselage as compared to the largely cosmetic fuselage pod which had no floor to it and therefore didn't do much to streamline the arrangement at all as illustrated in the January 1985 Ultralight Aircraft magazine which shows the VJ24W Sunfun in its final form as used by Volmer Jensen in 1984. He has a nose cone, he has the 57 inch diameter propeller, the 15 horsepower Yamaha two-stroke engine with a 4 to 1 belt drive reduction using a blade brake and a clutch so that he could stop the propeller and go soaring. It has the exhaust over the top of the wing, it retains the little bumblebee's tail fairing and it has spring steel leaf undercarriage, so it's got suspension. Quite a big step up from the original VJ24W, which had a welded steel undercarriage frame where the only suspension was the air in the tyres. The first one also had the exhaust blowing in your ear hole. That's a picture of Volmer Jensen, aged 73 in 1981, flying his original ultralight motor glider. Now Volmer Jensen was a conventional aeroplane designer and he had 22 designs under his belt, culminating in the VJ22 Sportsman, two seat side by side amphibious monoplane with wings, engine and some tail components of a Piper Cub to make for easier construction. And this might have been his final conventional design but Volmer Jensen was actually the bloke who built the first model of the Starship Enterprise for the original television series so he was famous in his own way apart from aeroplanes. But the Sportsman was pretty cool landed on the ground, landed on water, take it home on a trailer behind your car. But apparently in 1971, Volmer Jensen, the aeroplane designer, went to an American hang gliding contest and he saw that they were still hanging their arms over parallel bars and trying to swing their legs around to get enough control. And he tried that in 1930s and found it didn't work. Which isn't surprising because in 1896, Weight shift with parallel bars, swinging your legs around didn't work for Otto Lilienthal and it killed him. Same year it killed Percy Pilcher and his hawk. And in 1903, Octave Chanute couldn't get the method to work because you can't swing enough weight far enough. Apparently the Americans hadn't caught up with developments in Australia where John Dickinson in Grafton, northern New South Wales, had put an A-frame on a Regalo hang glider which meant that you could swing your whole body two or three feet in any direction and you could get plenty of weight shift control as proved by Bill Moyes when he first flew a Regalo wing with an A-frame to control it. But Volmer Jensen didn't know that and the Americans didn't know that so in 1971 on September the 30th to put the hang gliders out of their misery Volmer Jensen resurrected a design that he'd been flying in 1940 a foot launched aerodynamically controlled biplane hang glider called the VJ11 and it actually had three axis control via your two hands. A bit complicated but it worked and in 1972 it was the world's best hang glider. Not content to rest on his laurels in 19 72, Volmer released the VJ23 swing wing, which had all its controls on a single joystick in your right hand. 
It also had a wing that tapered in thickness and it tapered in plan form. So it was a bit of a pain to build because no two ribs in any one wing were the same size. 15 mile an hour stall, 20 mile an hour cruise, 9 to 1 glide ratio. And although it had parallel bars, you actually sat on a little seat that hung from a strap attached to the centre section. And if you took a swing wing to a hang gliding competition, you were going to win everything. And afterwards, you could take it home on a trailer behind your car, just like its predecessor, the VJ22. Come January 1974, and the VJ24 Sun Fund was released, retaining a single control stick for the right hand and the seat to sit on while you have your armpits over the parallel bars. 9 to 1 glide ratio, 15 mile an hour stall, parallel leading and trailing edges, so all the wing ribs are the same size, much easier to build. Jump off a 10 degree slope because it's got a 15 degree glide angle. So in 1974, Volmer Jensen was once again making the world's best foot launched aerodynamically controlled hang gliders. Meanwhile, in Australia in 1975, a bloke called Ron Wheeler had started putting lawnmower engines on a hang glider called a Tweety. In January 1976, he demonstrated this particular aircraft to the Australian Department of Transport Air Safety Branch and in August 1976 Air Navigation Order 95.10 was gazetted exempting minimum aircraft from all other air navigation orders. If it was under 400 pounds you didn't go over 300 feet and you didn't cross a road you didn't have to have a pilot's license and it didn't have to be inspected. Minimum aircraft were legal in Australia in 1976 which caused a bloke called David Cook and Volmer Jensen to get together with a swing wing and a McCulloch chainsaw motor and a stick and they had a foot launched powered ultralight. Of course it wasn't long before Volmer Jensen put a McCulloch chainsaw motor in the hang cage on a VJ24 Sun Fun thereby creating the VJ24 Sun Fun E which was not acceptable to the British authorities because they figured if you make a mess of the landing you can cut yourself in half at about kidney level with that sharp razor edged tiny little propeller. So Volmer had another talk to David Cook who we see here receiving an award from Prince Charles owing to his having flown a VJ 23E swing wing across the English Channel in one hour and 15 minutes which put him in the record books along with the swing wing first ultralight to fly the English Channel so to keep David Cook sweet with the British authorities the VJ24E became the VJ24W in 19... 81. World's first ultralight motor glider, which you also took home behind your car on a trailer. VJ24 Sun Fun, foot launched hang glider that could eat the regalos. VJ24E foot launched ultralight, forbidden in England due to the danger of chopping yourself in half. VJ24W with Bumblebee's bum rigid undercarriage and no nose fairing. You see how the trailing edge is light? It's because there's no fabric on the underskin from the rear spar to the trailing edge. Shows up particularly well in this photograph. My theory is that Irv Culver wanted to increase the drag, sort of like having your flaps permanently part the way down to slow the stall for foot launching speeds but once it had wheels you didn't need to do that so I suggested to my old mate who was building a VJ24 that he should skin his wing in carry that under surface all the way to the trailing edge and raise the stall speed, raise the cruise speed and improve the glide angle I also sketched him a floating bungee sprung undercarriage 
which was better than that rigid welded thing. So when he lost interest in the Jensen project because he wanted to go and play with an ultralight glider tug, and I bought the project in 1990, part of what I got was this rigid welded chrome molly steel undercarriage that he never ever fitted. I use it to keep the air flowing underneath my stack of firewood. When I purchased the project, it had my floating axle bungee sprung fitted to it, as well as the original plywood engine mount when it was going to be a VJ24E, the spring recovery parachute that I fitted, an old mate's curious idea of droppable fuel tanks which I haven't heard of since a World War I vintage fighter built in Austria. Another close-up of the plywood engine mount and the recovery parachute and the French engine with the Le Maire French propeller which at the time I thought was built too lightly to be able to cope with having a reduction drive fitted to it. My mistake, pity about that. Because on page 187 of the textbook here we see a JPX Pull 425 with a reduction drive. Gee, I wish I'd known about that. It left me stuck with a direct drive toothpick, which didn't actually last long when a taxiing incident without the wings fitted destroyed it very early on. Thus giving me the opportunity to design and laminate and carve my own idea of a good propeller which had been fitted to the aircraft by February 92 and shows in this picture. However, as well as the wings, I wasn't happy with the, um, the leading edge of the wing. One and a half millimetre styrofoam, fit for a butcher's meat tray in an open foam glass half sandwich was what Volmer Jensen had used, which was good for a hang glider. But didn't seem a good idea to me for a powered aircraft, so I took it all off and exposed Irv Culver's wing, the bloke who designed the Boeing 747's wing section. And I prepared to use core sample tray covers that I bought from a mining company for 42 cents a kilogram. Pop riveted on, transforming the leading edge into an open C section. A structurally strong leading edge that added six pounds per wing. And look to my Humbly arrogant eye, vastly better than foam styrene from a butcher's meat tray. Which I then covered with heat shrink aircraft grade Dacron and Stitz Polytac aircraft fabric adhesive. Because I wanted something more streamlined than this to fly around in, I designed an instrument panel that would fit in front of me and made a cardboard template which I was fairly proud of, proud of myself for thinking of it. Here's the compass and the auxiliary airspeed indicator displayed on the kitchen table. Finished panel in shiny, shiny aluminium. Not a bad bit of metalwork for a woodworker. Salvaging an aluminium road sign. So I took the instrument panel and fitted it to the forward upright tubes just about there, and I kept pop riveting core sample tray covers to it until it looked right. Here we see it taking off, climbing out, photographed air to air over the Glen Lee Road. Coming back into land at Glen Lee. It had a very flat glide. It wasn't easy to fit it into a normal runway. And here you have my humble self doing a Biggles imitation with me hand on the throttle. And now we're out of time, so I'll have to save the story of the test flying for another clip. Ciao.